if you're smiling My heart sings if you say Hurtful things, I'll let it go When we're lying In our bed With our own thoughts In our heads I live in a really uh, bush setting I live under an escarpment quite high up um, and I look out north over uh, a paddock and through forest to uh, to the distant escarpment and beyond that is Robertson, a, a town that looks down over Wollongong. Ah, yes. And um, Wollongong being the most, uh, I guess, the major centre outside of Sydney and it's an industrial town and that's where you grew up? I grew up in Wollongong, yes. I'm not that far away from where I actually grew up, although I came here via Sydney. And you've been based there for quite some time um, and making music. And I do know that you come from quite a musical family. Can you let us know about the influences you had growing up? Yeah, it seemed to always be a part of my life. I'm not sure that I can think back to a time where it wasn't part of my life. My grandfather was musical and um, and so time that I spent with him was always singing or doing something musical and then my mum and I used to uh, sing together before I really could do much else. Um, and I still actually have an old guitar of hers, it's an old mate, which is an Australian company. Uh, I've still got that, but that's the... That's the instrument that she'd sing songs to me and I'd eventually learn how to harmonise along with her and I it was, that's, my, that's my earliest memory, I think, of singing songs with her. And I know the banjo fits in there. In your latest clip, you're playing the banjo and, and was one of your family members particularly drawn to that instrument too? Yeah, Gramps played a, a banjo. He had a banjo mandolin, which is still actually kicking around at home as well, but it's, I think it's a pretty cheap instrument. I'm, I do toy with the idea of, um, of getting it up and running, but I think it's pretty buggered. The last time I looked at it, it was a bit split, and uh, I'm not really sure whether it's worth uh, rejuvenating, but it's kind of still in the family, I guess. Oh, wow. I've also often been curious about people who do grow up with such, compared to most people, like quite an intensive musical uh, influence, that becoming a, a songwriter, a serious songwriter, is not a foregone conclusion. How did it come about for you? Or can you think of a moment where you realised that I'm, this is what I want to do, I want to be writing, you know, telling stories in song form, and these are the people who influence me, and things like that? Yeah, no, look, it's interesting that you say that. I did start on trumpet, and, and I could have easily just kept on being a muse, or maybe even played in a in a symphony orchestra. I did play in, um, in the Wollongong Symphony when I was smaller, younger. Um, but it, it was when I left, um, left school and moved to Sydney and started working in studios that um, I started playing in a band again. I'd played in a band through high school and played drums and sang. Um, but as soon as I went to Sydney and just saw what was going on, I think I really wanted to do it. I wanted to be on the, the musician side of the glass rather than the technician side of the glass. And, um, and I've always been interested in words. My old man was, was big on words and reading. And, um, and I guess also just the music I was listening to when I was growing up was about songs and songwriting and rhyme. And so, yeah, it wasn't a foregone conclusion, but certainly it was what I was interested in. And, uh, mm. and, it, and when I started doing it, I guess then I fell in love with it and fell in love with the concept of how the hell do you do this, you know? Mm. And it, it's it's a really good thing because uh, you never get sick of it and it's never easy. So um, it's always a challenge. It, there's always something going on, something to learn. Absolutely, and uh, and it's and and history to draw on because I know that you're particularly interested, as myself, in in history and you know observing what's around you. The song "Grey Long Black" is that your first real exploration into? Telling, telling an historical story uh, in song form, or is, or is this your first sort of major statement in this way? Um, I've, I've been writing a whole series of folk songs while I've been living here in Kangaroo Valley. We had a couple of situations where the government were trying to do things, and so I, I wrote these protest songs, and 
one was a song about sedition and one was a song about raising a damn wall down here which involved a lot of research just trying to understand what the history of that dam was and and what it was meant to do and then also uh, I wrote a story about I uh, wrote a song about a bridge that they were repairing down here in Kangaroo Valley which is a really old heritage bridge and, um, so I started uh, reading about the history of that as well and trying to write these quite factual folk songs and I was toying with the idea of doing an entire album about Kangaroo Valley as, as sort of a series of folk songs. And, um, and so I was doing a lot of reading. Normally I'd read fiction, but I had started to read a bit of um, history, and particularly history of the uh, Liverpool Ranges and the country west of Tamworth. Um, it's the, sort of the black soil country, and it's where settlers first moved out of Sydney up into the rich country to try and, uh, you know, make a new life mm. and uh, and so it was in doing that kind of reading that I got involved in that story of um, Sydney Governor and Bree Long Black and that's where that song started to come out of but even even then I, I had a couple of goes at writing that song and failed I was, every time I started writing it it sounded really um, just cheap and I guess because it was such a huge issue and such a big story um, I think it took me a while just to work out how I was going to say it or say it anew because it had been told before. Um, the chant of Jimmy Blacksmith is is the most popular version of that story. And, and, and can you uh, inform the listeners, for Canadian listeners right now who, who know nothing about uh, the chant of Jimmy, Jimmy Blacksmith, what is the song about Real Long Black? At the turn of the century there was a fella called um, Jimmy Governor and he was a, a black man, a Koori man from um, out round Golgong Way, which is western New South Wales. And um, he married a white woman, Ethel, at the turn of the century. Probably, gee, I hate to say it, I'm embarrassed to say it, but in Australia it's probably still a rather strange thing to do. We're still pretty racist, but at that stage, at the turn of the century, it was a terrible thing for a, a white man to marry a... Sorry, a black man to marry a white woman that was frowned upon. And, uh, so her family kind of disowned her. And his people were pretty disparaging towards him as well. So they had a very difficult life together trying to uh, to make do. And they had a young son. And they lived on a, a white fellow's land. It was called the Brelong Run. And they were camped there as as black fellas did in those days and um, he had his brother with him Joe and a, a friend um, uh, Jackie Underwood and, uh, and some other family members and they were sort of trying to live there and Jimmy was working away on the Bree Long Run doing fencing at the time and uh, his whole life had been one series of hardships after another and I think because he was a proud man and a strong man got for having enough of it. At, at one stage, um, well, the, the thing that tipped him over the edge was that Malby, the owner of the Bree Long Run, he rejected a whole lot of split posts that Jimmy had um, done, I think, you know, hundreds of fencing posts that he'd got ready, and um, Malby rejected them and said he wouldn't pay for them. And, uh, and then when Ethel went up to the household to get the rations of flour and tea, Mrs. Malby was saying uh, all sorts of things like, you know, that you, she was a dirty piece of uh, work marrying a black fella and and they were being very disparaging up there at the household and making fun of her and taunting her and so she was bringing these stories back to Jimmy and he just had enough and he and Jackie went up to the household and they had an unarmed shotgun and they had a couple of nulla nullas which are big sticks that they'd thump things with and they, uh, they took to the women in the household and murdered them all and the kids and uh, one kid got away but um but they got in a rage and uh, and yeah made a hell of a mess i mean obviously it was very much the wrong thing to do but uh, i guess he was sort of pushed to that point too depending on which way you want to look at the story that's right so then they went on the run and uh and they were on the run i think they saw themselves as kind of bush rangers and, um, and Jimmy had a list of people that he was going to go and extract revenge on, uh, different uh, families around the district that had done the wrong thing by him. And so they, they picked up uh, Joe, his brother, and the three of them took off, and um, they were on the run for three months. 
and they killed another family in the area, the O'Brien family, and they um, they burnt properties down, and they were generally uh, gallivanting around the place, and they couldn't be caught. They had all these tricks up their sleeves from uh, Jimmy's black tracking days and just their knowledge of the bush, and no one could find them. And they kept on doubling back on themselves, and They'd walk down railway lines and they're impossible to track. Sometimes they'd be hiding under a bridge while a whole lot of uh, white fellas went past them over the top on horses and making a lot of noise. They'd just be quietly sitting under the bridge. Um, so they kept all these uh, people at bay at the turn of the century. It was the, it was the talk of the town. It made all of the newspapers and it was this huge manhunt for these three, three black fellas. And, um, of course, eventually they were captured and, and Jimmy was uh, taken down to the big jail in Sydney and because it was celebration for the Federation time and there was all sorts of merriment and everything, they didn't want to distract from that so they kept Jimmy in prison for a further three or four months and hung him quietly after all the festivities had happened. So even, um, even his death was something that was denied him any chance to make a statement with or anything like that and uh, I guess I kind of even though he was a murderer and, and what he did was wrong um, I couldn't help but feel like he had also done the only thing that was available to him and that was to, to fight back um, and so I was captivated by it and yeah that's where the song sort of started from and very very sad story sad for all, all the the people involved, of course, the white families and the black families. Mm, absolutely. And uh, you've done a, a very affecting treatment of, of that story. And I can tell the detail that you know of the story, too. You've definitely pondered it for quite a lot of time and, and treated it, treated the story with, with the utmost respect. And I know that it's uh, the, through the writing of this song, you actually were able to establish a relationship with uh, a relative of, of Jimmy. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Well, look, um, if I can just step back to the song was um, in a sort of an essay form when I took it to the studio um, recording this album with Sid Green. And, um, and it was very much a co-write between he and I. He sort of found the, um, the feel of the song and the chord progression. And from that, the song became really easy once we worked out how to breathe and how to have some air in it. And, um, it was as if the story told itself then, which was, it kind of almost went out of my hands, and um, we just had to do it the way we did it. But um, yes, an another friend, Tanya Bauer, who sang backing vocals on the album, she came down and we played her that song, Very Long Black, and said, geez, what do you think, hey? And she said, well, I saw a, I saw a theatre piece last year in Sydney at Carriage Works, called Post in the Paddock and it was written by descendants of Jimmy Governor and descendants of the O'Brien family, the second family that he murdered and they did a theatre piece together as a sort of a form of reconciliation and a coming, coming to grips with their shared um, traumatic history and what's really interesting about that is the O'Brien family still owns the land there um, that was sort of part of that history and Jimmy Governor's descendants still live on and they still live with that shame as well and the horror of it. And um, and so this theatre piece was a way of them coming to grips with it. So we immediately, upon hearing that, thought, Christ, we've got to get in contact with these people and um, and make sure that they're OK with this song and, and that they're OK with what we've done. And, and so I tried to make contact with all of the four key people and luckily Loretta Parsley, Auntie Loretta Parsley, who's Jimmy Governor's great-granddaughter, she um, she kindly made contact with us and and I've been, I've been seeing her and talking to her on a weekly basis ever since. In fact, she was up here staying with us for three days last week and um, another lovely time spent together just sharing stories and uh, and, he, and learning more about her and, and Jimmy and, and her family too. Well, I guess the interesting thing for me is that um, when I wrote the song, when Sid and I wrote the song, I was uh, pretty stupid. I sort of thought that I was just writing about something that happened in the past. I didn't really realise that... Um, of course the families keep living, you know, and whatever they, 
however they have children and however they keep trying to survive, the story keeps going too. Oh. And, and so it's been it's been a really interesting journey to uh, to get to know Aunty Loretta and and really to um, to kind of get that greater depth to the story. It's made it very real to me and. Um, and she's, of course, she's happy with the song and happy with what we've done with it. And she appeared in the video clip. And, and so that was an honour as well, um, just to, to know that we hadn't, we hadn't stuffed up the story and we hadn't done the wrong thing, which was really good. Yeah, and a real, real uh, sort of sacred element, I guess, to it in, in some respect too. And, and the connection, I mean, your geographical connection to the part of the world that you know, here there's access to the family, you actually you happen to live right there, you know, reasonably close, I guess. Uh, um, so that's interesting well, how it played out. It, it's very interesting because, in fact, um, after Jimmy was hanged, Ethel came down and lived in Wollongong for a while, and um, and then she moved further down the coast to Naruma, and. Um, and so it's really, it's amazing because uh, that, that history of the, the survival of, of Jimmy's family is all around this area and Loretta grew up in Nowra, which is a town close to it, and, uh, and she lives down near Batemans Bay now, uh, back on her country, and, um, and so it's, yes, well, geographically right in the middle of it, it's, um, it's, as all these things often are, it's really interesting, you know, you wouldn't expect that it would be that way. Uh, absolutely. That's, I mean, this song is really going to take a life of its own, I can tell, and hopefully, you know, raise awareness for a younger generation about the story and about the, the, the challenges still ahead with healing for everyone around relations with, with the, uh, you know, the Aboriginal people of, of, of our country. Yeah. Oh, look, exactly. The one thing that I've um, really learned, I think, more than anything is that that um, we still, as white people in this country, we still need to hear the stories um, and we need to hear them a couple of times. We don't need to just hear them once and think that we're done with it. And, um, and that the black people do want to tell stories and they do want their... They want to be heard and, um, and we haven't been listening. So it's... Yeah, there's, we've got a lot to learn. We've, got, we've still got a lot of ground to cover and uh, we're nowhere near getting things right with Aboriginal people in this country, so... Um, you know, and I, I, mean, I, I, I play a point. Sorry, I was going to say, if, if I play a point zero 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 one percent part in it, I'll be pretty proud of that. You know? Well, I think you definitely have, and, uh, and with the beauty of the internet, I mean, how did someone in the, the other side of the world discover this? You know, that's how it all works now. That you're able to um, have people in Vancouver and beyond hearing the story. Um, yeah, and I mean, I should say too. I mean, I'm. I'm somewhat embarrassed that I've never read the book. I've never even seen the film. I, I did not know this story until you told me. And um, so there you go. I've been through the whole Australian education system and not been exposed to this. So, um, yeah. You know. I studied it at school um, as a kid, but it might be an era thing, you know. Mm. And even um, and Thomas Keneally, the guy that wrote it, does reckon that he would have done a different version of it today, knowing what he knows. So... Um, Hmm. Even that's interesting in itself, you know. I see, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, that's uh, that's really fascinating. Thanks for sharing your insights into that that particular song. Um, now I do know that you uh, you do have a release out. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the rest of the album, uh, how it fits thematically with with that song? Yeah. Look, I spoke before about how. Um, once we'd worked out how the chords were going to work, it let the song breathe and it kind of wrote itself. I um, I was lucky when I um, when I teamed up with Sid Green, my producer. He um, he had the utmost faith in me as an artist, and so the album that we made together, and we very much made it together, is um, it's just so measured and and easy, uh, and it has it has a real well, I hope maturity about it and kind of a really... It, we were trying to make beautiful art um, beyond sort of normal songwriting. Probably sounds a bit lofty and maybe a little bit pretentious, but uh, that was what we were going for. And I, and I, I hope that, that pace and that, 
that sureness is kind of in the songs and in the instrumentation of it. There's a lot of air and, um, you know, also like in the old days when jazz players were playing, they'd, they'd often say it was what you didn't play that was just as musical as the notes you were playing. And I think that was kind of like almost a mantra on this album as well as you don't have to fill every song with words and you don't have to fill every uh, part of the music with notes. Sometimes it's that that breath and sometimes it's those things that you don't say that are just as important so this is kind of like an album that's been really um, made with a lot of care and a lot of love but also um, there's a lot of I hope kind of mystery or just stuff that a listener can can form themselves over over listening to it you know a couple of times I hope that it engages people and it's, it's something that you know, you talk about albums as being a creeper or something, hey, you know, something that you don't necessarily get at all the first time and it, it's only after repeated listenings that you start really working your way into it. And I hope it's one of those kind of albums too. From what I, from what I can hear on, on uh, Bandcamp so far, it certainly is. And I'm actually enjoying discovering folks like yourself and a few other songwriters I've discovered since I've moved here and started doing this show because... Um, it, it's, a, it's a more sophisticated sound than what I'm used to growing up in the Australian rock and roll culture, which is wonderful. But people like yourself are operating at such a more subtle level, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be discovering you right now. You know, there's a richness yeah. to some Australian songwriters that needs to be heard. It's a good era to be making music in, you know, um, and particularly that sort of alternate folk genre. I'm calling this stuff beardy country as well, but um, I think, you know, like there, there is an emphasis on melody and words and, and good songwriting again. We've gone out the other side of um, manufactured pop music and, uh, and it's a great time to be, to be trying to make meaningful music. Um, of course, it's the harder thing is working out how you make any money from it, but um, but the making of it and the, and hopefully the people listening to it is is the best it's ever been. I, I think so too, and uh, I can't help but notice too that you have a, a connection with the Kilby family, and of course Steve Kilby stands out as a, you know as extraordinary uh, talent in um, the world of song in, in Australia, and I don't know a lot about the other Kilby brothers. Uh, are they brothers? Yes, there's, there's three boys in the family, and um, and as you say, yeah, Stephen's an amazing songwriter, um, and when I uh, was living in Sydney for a while, I was living with um, with Stephen and Russell, and, uh, and then later on with John as well. So um, Russell had a band called The Crystal Set, and they were really quite popular in the um, mid-80s and into the late 80s, uh, particularly in Sydney, but... Um, I think some international releases as well through Red Eye. And then John Kilby was in a band called the Bhagavad Guitars, um, also a very popular independent um, band around that time. And then they both went on and did projects together like uh, Five Days in the Photon Belt. And, um, you know, there's been quite a few sort of collaborative albums between either two or three of the brothers. So, um, yeah, very creative family. and. Um, I, I guess probably I'm closest to John. He's uh, he'd be sort of one of my closest friends, I guess. So um, yeah, we spend a lot of time together and uh, and have done albums together as well. I've played on his um, albums and he's been involved in music with me over the years as well. So um, yeah, rich rich musical family. There's no doubt about it. And. Um uh, in terms of, uh, again, more quality songwriting, I know you uh, have contributed to an Elliot Smith compilation, and for some reason, for myself, only this year, uh, the, the genius of Elliot Smith songs have hit me, and I've been listening to the first two albums, at least. Uh, what is your connection to his music? Um, you must be quite a fan, I guess, to contribute a song. Oh, yeah, look, um, I've, I've admired Elliot's music for a long time, and um, actually it's funny that you should bring him up, because last night we listened to... Um, I've just got my stereo fixed again, and it's nice having speakers all of a sudden, and so we listened to 
Mate, a song by Ben Folds about Elliot Smith, and then of course we went on an Elliot Smith rave and listened to um, Figure Eight, the album, which would be probably still my favourite Elliot Smith album. And yeah, what a songwriter, heavily influenced by the Beatles, mad for the Beatles, and um, and yeah, just that honesty. I guess I respond mostly to um, to the honesty in his writing and. And the, sometimes it's so stark and, uh, and sometimes very, very hard to listen to, but always deeply moving and really engaging, very, very honest, multi-instrumentalist, uh, really, really talented guy. I would have loved to have been able to meet him. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, and, you know, I guess, like, the, the mystery of his passing just, you know, keeps... would probably keep his music alive, except that I think really the strength of the songs would have kept them alive too I, I, I'd love to have heard what he'd be doing these days you know? wow. that's right uh, yeah it's coincidental because the, the last uh, person I interviewed uh, a gentleman fairly close to your neck of the woods he goes by the name of Ocean Leaves and uh, he, right. he brought up uh, if you ever hear that name uh, check him out um, he lives in uh, the Blue Mountains and does you know wonderful music um, and he brought up Elliot Smith specifically as well, and, and, and now you today. It's uh, interesting. Um, yeah. And, and again, and that's, that brings uh, the two worlds, uh, the Pacific Northwest to Australia. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think exactly. it was Portland, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Andy. Uh, is, there any, is there anything else that we didn't really get to that you wanted to mention? Or? Oh, look. You know, please check out the album, um, the Reverend Jorfy, and uh, and you know, I mean, write on my Facebook page or get in contact. You know, I'm happy mm. to chat with anyone, and um, I think that's the that's the amazing thing about music today, and and even things like Facebook, you can actually talk to uh, the artist and you mm. can interact in a way that we never could as kids when we were listening to music. You know, I kind of worked out how the hell I could have contacted any of the artists that I was keen on when I was listening to music. So. Uh, mm. You know, today it's actually really easy. It's really accessible. That's a good point. So please don't be shy if anyone's got questions or wants to chat, you know. Yeah. Totally up for it.